Dear and gracious God, um, how we need you this day. We need you each and every day, but I pray now that as we worship together, we will witness, Lord, the, the worship of others and that your grace will be bestowed upon us through the words that I have chosen for today. May they be your words. And, Lord, may our worship be acceptable in thy sight. So it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, today really started out, I, I didn't start out to do it this way, but it's going to end up as a part one of a series. And I don't know how many parts there's going to be just yet, but this is so critical and so important. And I had so many pages of notes that I figured you all would want me to divide this up a little bit, not try to give it to you all at one time. Otherwise, we'd be here for quite a long time and I'd hear about it and I'm getting the look from Kirk up here. Boy, oh boy, am I getting the look. Uh, so, being that this is Reformation Sunday, I'm normally prone to tell this remarkable story, and it is remarkable. If you don't know it, um, you know, I would suggest you go back and you, you read it and you study it. The story of Martin Luther's life, he was a very unique, a very powerful individual whom God used, as well as the other reformers in a mighty way, and and on today, I'm normally I would be talking about you know their work, um, what they've done to plow up the fertile ground of the gospel, and it paved the way for the modern day Protestant church. Now, by using that word Protestant, more and more of these terms are you know becoming less and less used um, by people. I'm meaning to include all the modern day expressions of the church, whether they be Lutheran. Methodist, Presbyterian, non-denominational, etc., you name it. Um, but today's different. Okay, so today I was moved to just delve headfirst into the deeper meaning of the gospel, the meat and potatoes of it, which is uh, the Reformation, what, what it was centered upon. I figured that was critical for us to go back and revisit. See, Because you see, in reality, the Reformation didn't create anything that wasn't already there. What it did was it simply helped remove the barriers that had been erected over time due to sin, which prevented people from seeing the richness and the power of the gospel. And it was there all along. We just somehow allowed it to get covered over. So if you have your Bibles open to Romans 3, notice how I slipped that in there. Hoping you'll take the hint, uh, Bible's open to Romans 3. Just let me say that the first three chapters, and really you could say the entire letter of Romans, is like going to school. It's as if we're in the classroom um, studying the nature of salvation 101. Um, when Paul was writing to the church in Rome, he was writing in order to fill them in on what salvation was really all about. In fact, the entire letter... Of the road to the Romans is all about your salvation, my salvation, what it means to be saved. In other words, how did God bring about our salvation anyway? So if you pondered and struggled with this, perhaps either for yourself or maybe even how to, you would explain this to someone else, this book of Romans is really the book for you. And while the letter was meant to be read as a collective whole, you know, the, reading the entire letter. We don't have time to do all of that. So hopefully I'm going to fill in a few of the holes and, and we'll just kind of review as we go along. Um, there's one verse, okay, in the first chapter that kind of sums up everything. It's key. Paul says it in uh, uh, verse 16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And you find that theme going throughout the whole book. Uh, Paul spends the first two chapters really telling us that all of humankind, all of it, is under the wrath of God. And then he divides us basically into three categories. There are, number one, the godless, those who could care less about faith and a God. There is the moralist, the one who's not necessarily religious, or has faith of any kind, but has a conscience, even though they cannot keep it perfectly. And then number three, there are the religious people, or the followers, the believers, you might say. And Paul said that there are, all three of them are under the wrath 
of God. In other words, everybody. Now, as we get to chapter 3, Paul's going to underscore the fact that no one is righteous nor can stand before God based on the way that we've lived our lives, no matter how good you think you might be. And he's going to reveal, though, in the same chapter, how you can be righteous before God. So if you've ever wondered, if you've ever had someone ask you, how are we made right, put in a right standing with God, this is the chapter, chapter 3, where Paul will address the subject. This, by the way, is the text that came leaping off the page for Martin Luther, brought him to new life, created, you know, uh, led to the real reformation that was going to take place as he began to discover the power in the text for our freedom in Christ Jesus. But before we get there, I'm going to deal with um, several verses in the chapter leading up to that. You know, Paul brings up a whole lot of rhetorical questions, some of which he answers, but some of which the answers are so obvious that he doesn't bother to answer. And earlier, Paul had asserted something, that the religious Jews, he said, were under the wrath of God. So he was reminding all of us, okay? Again, religion does not save us. Not religion. You can be as religious as you want to be, okay? Um, But it's not going to be the difference in why you get into heaven. So Paul asks in verse 1 of chapter 3, then what advantage does a Jew have, if any? was another way of saying, um, is there an advantage of being a Jew, being in this covenant relationship with God? If the Jews are under the same wrath as Gentiles and pagans. And he answers the question in verse 2. He says, the Jews, after all, were entrusted. He calls them the oracles of God, the teachings, the utterances of God. Um, In other words, they were a people set apart. For a special, the Lord's special purpose. It was from the Jews, after all, that the law and the prophets were derived. And, uh, and that was unique. No other nation could claim this. But Paul gets around to asking in verse 3 about, what about if the Jews were unfaithful in this process? And he poses the question, would that nullify, do away with, the faithfulness of God, to which he answers his own question. And the answer is a resounding no. He recalls you know, the Old Testament. It was a history of Israel's backslidden condition. They kept going back into sin. So he's really asking, uh, since they were unfaithful, does that somehow nullify what God gave them and um, what God did for them regarding the word of God? And Even though the Israelites' record was one of continual, ongoing failure, it didn't change one bit, one iota what God was doing through them for their sakes and for that of the world. However, when you think about this for a moment, just step back. And one of the greatest challenges to sharing the word, which is what we all should be thinking about, that's our purpose, sharing the word, getting the gospel out there, living it with our lives. Um, So, one of the biggest obstacles is our history. When you talk to someone about Christ or the Bible, you know, it's not politically correct today, right? It's getting to be less and less so. So um, they're likely, the person that you're talking to is likely to bring up times in our history when believers acted contrary to what the Bible says, when they committed crimes, perhaps, horrible offenses and atrocities against humanity. And they'll start by saying maybe something like, you Christians. And they'll say, and then they'll follow with something like, how could I possibly follow a religion which sent people out to murder and destroy in the name of Jesus Christ, as in the time of the Crusades, for example? They have a difficult time in this separating the message from the behavior and response of God's people. Yet the actions of God's people, Paul is arguing, don't nullify what God said. What the other person is doing in this case is really only trying to deflect the conversation by putting Christianity on the defensive. Um, That's basically trying to avoid dealing with the real message, I believe, which is that there is a calling to discipleship upon our lives, if it's true. So we learn then 
that unfaithfulness doesn't nullify what God has done in the least. Again, for those who would bring something like that up, just a defense mechanism, they're trying to push away the conversation because it makes them uncomfortable. They don't want to deal with it. Now, the worst thing that you and I can do, by the way, is try and defend some of those things that have happened in the past. But you know, on the contrary, the best thing we can do is acknowledge that there are times when believers have done things that are wrong and cruel. But we still pose the question, do you think then that that would nullify God's message? What are we doing here? Well, we're basically taking people out of the equation and saying, let's talk about God. So let's take religious systems out of the question. Let's talk about Jesus then for a few moments here and what he taught. But I think first Paul would say we need to understand the character of who Jesus really is. Um, and you can sum up Paul's message when, as, as he does using, he quotes from Psalm 14 and 53 in the passage that Janice read for us, basically to say no one's righteous, not a single soul. That's what the Psalms say. This is why that argument, by the way, you, know, you Christians are so self-righteous, it lacks any kind of truth. For no Christ follower can, can boast of being self-righteous. There is no righteousness, right, outside of the Lord Jesus. And, uh, and here you have the nature of who Jesus is. He alone is the righteous one. He is righteous. So there's your first, your witnesses here. So you're going to go out. I want you to go out and, and begin to explain this to people. So Paul, he's bringing everybody under the same tent. And it's interesting, Paul, who was Paul? He was a Jew of Jews, okay, a Pharisee. He was set apart and raised and schooled in the law. Yet he's saying everyone's on the same level as they come before God. Now, he's going to tell us some really bad news. Are you ready? <laughs> in verses 19 and 20, he's basically saying by works of the law, no flesh, no, that is to say no person will be justified in his sight. For the law, by the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now, in your Bibles, and, and I wish you had them with you here because what I'd want you to do is underline that verse. Verses 19 and 20, let them be imprinted on your heart. It is not possible to be justified by works of the law. The only thing the law can do, the only thing it does do, is give us knowledge of sin. That's what the law does. Some people think, on the contrary, you can keep it. And so they try to. But the law is meant to give you knowledge about just how bad you really are. Later in, uh, the, in, the, uh, in the letter, in chapter 5, in verse 20, and I'm quoting from the New Living Translation here, it says, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. That pretty much sums it up. I often say it this way. The law of God is like your bathroom scale. You've got to love that instrument, right? <laughs> Not. Um, you can get on the bathroom scale. It will tell you your weight, but it doesn't make you lose weight, unfortunately, does it? It cannot do that. It wasn't meant to do that. It, it simply tells you what you weigh. In a similar fashion, that's what the law tells you. You look into the law and it tells you how you've fallen short. That's its function, reminding us, I can't do this and be justified before God. Now, what's the best way to get at this? So, you know, if you think like I do, I need some, put some flesh on this. What do you mean? Because I kind of grew up thinking I was a pretty good guy. You know, what sin do I have? I'm ashamed to admit it now, but I actually used to, Think along that way. Well, study the Ten Commandments. That's the reason they're part of the catechism. We deal with it over several weeks. Because if you think you can follow the law, really take time. Don't take the Ten Commandments at surface value. Understand what they mean. For example, if you're going to say, uh, you know, if you're going to follow the, law, the commandment, you know, do not kill, what does that mean? What about if I kill somebody's reputation? You know, 
what other things do I kill out there by, even though I'm not doing it physically, just as an example. Um, and so I want to kind of review for you for a minute now. One of the, one of the <laughs> blessings of me acting as your secretary is I'm getting more familiar with PowerPoint. So I actually have asked Mike for, to put some slides up there for me. I want to kind of sum up what we've talked about so far, that Paul has said the wrath of God is coming. There is nothing we can do to stop it, okay? And then point number two, the entire world is condemned as sinful. There's no, not one people group uh, that's not under condemnation, whether it's the godless person, the educated moralist, or the religionist. They are equally all under God's wrath. And there's a third thing. The law was given to show us how sinful we are. Okay? Number three, how sinful we are, and uh, to, to note that, and then that brings us to number four, um, good works will not help us avoid God's wrath and judgment. So let's close in prayer and go home, right? Uh, I hope you're not saying right and agreeing to, because that, if that's all there were, this would be a pretty hopeless situation, would it not? And this is actually what I believe Paul wants you to, to feel as he is writing his letter, to feel how hopeless it would possibly, it could possibly be. And we're often guilty of wanting to jump immediately to the good news. And we're getting there. But um, do you know, by the way, that a lot of people cannot hear the good news? They don't hear it as good news. We might be all pumped up to tell someone about the good news of their righteousness in Christ. So we approach someone, maybe perhaps excitedly, and say, yeah, hey, I have got the best news for you ever in the world. Do you know Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and therefore you can have eternal life? You've lost them right there in many cases. So they don't see themselves as a sinner. They may even respond and say, you know, I think I'm a pretty good person. Of course God is going to accept me. They don't understand all the stuff that I've just given you, the God, that, that no people are righteous before God. And then we come to verse 21, the words, but now, how important those two words are. But now, wonderful words, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I know you hear that and it just kind of almost escapes you the way uh, it is written there. But I'm going to tell you right now, that is one of the most powerful verses in all of the Bible. Okay? One of the most powerful verses of all. And I want to give you three phrases that are used here that are helpful. And we're going to put those up on the screen as well. The first is it talks about being a, that righteousness comes apart from the law. The second is that we are justified by his grace. And I'm going to explain a little bit about that. And then thirdly, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, that is how righteousness comes. So first of all, it's apart from the law. And through this righteousness that he offers, uh, what Paul says is you're justified by grace. And this righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Let me elaborate just a Briefly. So, apart from the law means it has nothing to do with keeping the law. You cannot, I cannot be a good enough person. Secondly, this righteousness that he offers means we are justified by his grace. Now, that's a big theological word. We get lost there so many times. Um, and, and, and we could really get tangled in the weeds on this whole thing about the word justified. But I'm going to give you a way to think about this, hopefully in a new way. And here's how I want you to remember it. Justified is just as if. Just as if I had never sinned before God. 
That's what justification means. It's the craziest thing in the world. The Bible says this, there will come a time when all of us, okay, will stand before God in judgment. But for those of us who have put our trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, what's going to happen? God will not see our sin. It's going to be just as if we never sinned. Which means, essentially, he's going to look at you and say, that one, that one, that one's mine. On them, there is no spot or blemish. They have been justified in my sight. And then the last part of the verse tells you how. You're going to be justified through faith for all who believe. Now, on the surface of it, that sounds too good to be true. But if we believe it, okay, we begin to say it is real and it's personal. I can say to myself, it really happened. He really died for me and therefore it really is finished. It's done. The wrath of God has been consumed by Jesus Christ. It's done. It's the most amazing thing that's ever happened to the human race. Now, really, we're at the point where we're just getting warmed up, but don't worry. <laughs> we haven't dealt with the nature of what happens to God's wrath. Does it just go away? Just disappear into thin air? Of course not. And what happens to the law? Does the law go away? Do I no longer need to be bound by that? By no means. And this is where it gets interesting. This is the nuts and the bolts of our faith, people, the glue that holds it together. But how does God work it out without compromising who he is? He is holy and just. So stay tuned. Next week, we're going to go a little bit deeper. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Kent Hollis. I hope this message was meaningful to you and touched your heart in some way. We encourage you to check out our website at sjlcmetro.com. That's sjlcmetro.com. You can get further information regarding our ministry here at St. John Lutheran Church. And may the Lord bless you richly as you seek to be in relationship with him.